Hello everyone, uh, my name is Festos Adedoin and I am a senior lecturer at the Department of Computing and Informatics, Bournemouth University uh, here in the UK. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the fifth international conference on computing and data science. Uh, and I'm glad to deliver this keynote speech uh, looking at data, simulations, and environmental sustainability policymaking in times of crisis. Uh, particularly, uh, I am focusing on trying to understand how data science tools can be used to enhance uh, decision making, particularly in terms of climate change and environmental sustainability. Um, particularly, I start this keynote speech today uh, by you know, talking about the application of data, the, the benefits of data, uh, it, we cannot overemphasize how important we need to have some data uh, to understand any problem. Uh, and the use of simulation uh, to work with historical data and maximize those historical data in understanding what the future holds for any policy. Uh, and particularly, because we have several algorithms, several development within machine and deep learning models that could help us, help us predict uh, key macroeconomic variables, but also maximize uh, climate change variables within a model, uh, then it's, it becomes imperative to you know, contribute to the debate, uh, also guide businesses, guide you know, green businesses, or even guide the government or, or local council, local government, national government in their policies. So if they would like to invest in renewable energy, for example, or if they would like to disinvest from non-renewables or dirty energy sources like coal and so on and so forth. It could also be uh, an opportunity to bid into funding for projects that are funded by the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the Asian or African development banks, and so on and so forth. Um, it, and the, the kind of data that I used in this case uh, stem from several, you know, monthly data or quarterly data or yearly data that are available in public repositories. Uh, and the use of those data in line with the trend, the history of those data within an economic model or a climate model uh, can be used with data science tools. And I will demonstrate from a case study uh, from one of my research uh, in, in this presentation. We do know uh, that data, you know, simulation, data science as a whole, you know, gives us a smart way to look at the world. Uh, and it gives us, you know, an opportunity to develop efficient algorithms, uh, you know, to, to work with models that are data driven, uh, you know, helps us to adapt from historical data, learn about the future, use several computations to produce reliable estimates that can be repeated, that can be verified empirically and tested or retested. Uh, and this, this is not new. You know, several scholars in this conference make such presentations, work with such research. Uh, but the, the issue of climate change is very important. And what, what I try to say in terms of how data and simulations work together is we try to understand the nature of the data. We try to understand the importance of that data, uh, the, the types of data that we have. And we do know that you know, collecting data is very expensive. It's difficult and nearly impossible to collect data about the future. But you can understand what policy options uh, that can, that is best or will yield the best result uh, using historical data. Uh, and, and, and simulation does that perfectly. And I will talk about one of those approaches today uh, in, in my talk. And, but before I go into the application of these models and these tools, I want to contextualize the story, the research story. And the research story that my presentation is all about is environmental sustainability. And we all know about the, uh, uh, the Conference of Parties, the COP27 that happened in Egypt this year, uh, in 2022. Uh, and we can understand uh, all of the arguments and all of the need to really take climate change seriously, to really take uh, environmental sustainability, green economy, circular economy, and all of these conversations really seriously. Um, but it becomes difficult to make policies when we have crisis. Um, and there has been a number of crises, you know, in the world, there's been Brexit in Europe, in the UK, uh, that there's been the COVID-19 pandemic, which, you know, the most, most countries are still recovering from. Uh, there has been tensions of war in some parts of the world. Uh, there's been, you know, a few property issues, property crashes, and all of these issues makes it very difficult 
to try to understand what direction should the government take or should a business take. Uh, and using historical data, uh, you know, data science, computing and informatics tools can help us predict um, what, what strategy will be best, having several underlying conditions. And that's what my uh, keynote argues for today in this presentation. There are some potential research, you know, not just about you know, uh, research story and environment, but there are also structural dynamics about economics, uh, or about, about you know, uh, funding or bidding or projects, project management, and, and several issues uh, in education, in agriculture, in mining, in tourism, and so on and so forth. Um, there are also the application of some of these tools uh, you know, to subnational integration of development indicators or simulating policy options to understand trade, to understand development, sustainability of institutions, local businesses, and so on and so forth. So there are options. There are several issues uh, that we can look at. In my case study, uh, in this keynote speech, I try to demonstrate how this simulation can work. Uh, when we look at options open to the government, so renewable energy, investing billions of pounds in renewable energy sources, or clean, clean technology, uh, green technology, efficient technology, or divesting, so spending money to divest uh, from non-renewables like coal. Uh, and so if we consider two policies before a national government, um, some would argue for going for just one policy, some would argue for going for both policies um, and, and, and giving different focus to, to run renewables and renewables at the same time. The goal being to abate emissions, to, to ensure that we have a greener society. And there are so many debates uh, in the literature, which I wouldn't be going onto here. And in this case study, we use machine learning driven simulation to try to understand this policy option for a country like Japan. Japan being, as of 2018, uh, and I think recently as well, one of the most uh, I mean, the, the, the most complex, uh, according to Harvard growth, growth Lab, we see Japan as the most complex economy in the world. And what that means is that there are a lot of processes that goes into producing every product in Japan. Uh, it tells you of the technicality of the know-how, the capabilities that goes into a given product um, in Japan. But what does that mean? Uh, it, it just tells you the consumption of energy that will be required. Uh, to actually have a very complex process um, in making products in, in a country like that. But looking at that structure, uh, looking at that economy, uh, if we try to understand, and we also definitely do know from the data that you know, Japan is the seventh largest emitter uh, in the world. There's the US, there's China, and, you know, and several other countries that are large emitters of greenhouse gases, uh, but we know Japan to be the seventh. So, so it's a very you know, cautious case study. It's a very applicable case study that we can use to understand um, uh, um, the arguments in, in my talk. Um, and there are options open. So the first option in terms of policy direction being reduce consumption of non-renewable energy sources like coal um, or increase investment in renewables, which most people support. Several papers, several researchers, several inventors, uh, engineers, all argue for the need to you know use more solar panels or and so on and so forth and we're not going into climate science as it were but we do need to understand if i were a government with all of the economic conditions and covid and everything that has happened what will be the best option and i want to use a data-driven machine learning model to see which way uh should we go into and a novel attempt here is made using you know a dynamic uh autoregressive distributed lag model which has a canal based um, regularized least square um, applied to a time series data here. And we, we, we start with a simple machine learning algorithm, uh, and then we account for several problems that you know uh, most modelers and forecasters would account for uh, in terms of heterogeneity, additivity, nonlinear effect, and so on and so forth. There are several potential applications to this model, uh, which again, some of you may have used it before, but I argue that it's a very powerful model. For example, during the pandemic, the UK government had the eat out to help out scheme. So a researcher might want to explore what's the importance of this scheme. Was it effective? Was it weak? Could it have been better? And so on and so forth. We also had the fallout scheme where people were paid for, you know, uh, to cover for some time. You can test policy directions using machine learning to see what will be the impact in 10, 20, 40 years time. 
where would the government, where would the economy be? And again, this can apply to businesses um, and so on and so forth. And uh, we look at, you know, so many arguments or, you know, what the foundation is, because, uh, you know, this research or this case study from this keynote uh, looks at, you know, uh, the, the, the modeling and then the forecasting. So some researchers focus solely on forecasting, but it's always good to start with a level of modeling. So you model an equation or you model um, uh, an argument from a theory or from a concept, and then you forecast based on some algorithm. So that's what we, we, we started with here. First is the modeling, and then we move on into um, the argument itself. And in terms of the model, uh, but before I go into the model, I also like to talk, tell you very quickly about the data sources. So you'd need to capture some variables based on the theory, but you'd also need to have different sources to understand exactly how to measure and what best measure can be used. And there are so many data sources from this paper. I would share the slides. And if you want to have a look or have a conversation, please feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, but in terms of the model, we see that uh, we capture all of the different lags, so time lags um, across the different cycles here. And we have a very clear estimation or process of the empirical scheme. And this is from uh, the paper published uh, in, in Data in Brief uh, and in Modeling uh, from one of the journals, who shows very clearly with the empirical scheme. So there's the ARDL model, which is a start. Make sure you have your optimal lag selection that you go into the dynamic ARDL. But before you get to all of those higher level, you need to ensure you go through, you know, uh, the unit root test. Then you move on to your estimation. Then you conduct your bounds testing. Then you move on to the dynamic algorithm, having your counter fascia shocks, which is where we're going. Um, and then you make sure you have every other validation checks to make sure your model is correct. Your predictions are fine. Uh, and, and whatever policy options or directions you say are reliable. And th this is sort of the empirical scheme. Again, I would share the PowerPoint. And again, you have access to explore some of these. Um, some of the data are presented again within the PowerPoint. There's also a paper that could guide you on this. Uh, but then you also then have the results being presented, which tells you that core renewable energy can definitely reduce emissions. This is not new knowledge. We know from the modeling. Um, and then we move on to the simulation itself, which argues that, you know, there have been several studies uh, recently, the growing studies are now adopting this modeling approach and forecasting approach to try to understand what policy options should be take, should be taken for uh, achieving the, you know, uh, uh, climate change objectives. Uh, and then again, still on the modeling, there are also some results uh, that, that have been exploited here. Again, the model is consistent to show us that you know, renewable energy uh, does reduce emissions, which is not news again, as I mentioned. Uh, while non-renewable here being coal rent, um, you know, has the possibility of enhancing or improving emissions. So you use dirty energy sources, you have more emissions. Again, these are not news uh, within the literature. And then we move on into the, um, you know, the, the, the counterfactuals. Now, here we argue, if we try to incorporate a pledge, so Japan has a pledge uh, that says that by 2030, in six years or in seven years' time, um, you know, we will be able to reduce emissions significantly by 26%. Now, that's a very ambitious objective. But we think that should you reduce reliance on coal energy or should you invest in, in renewables? Um, unfortunately, we, 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 we've decided to look at uh, these two options, investing in renewables or uh, divesting, that is disinvesting in non-renewables. Uh, and so we have counterfactual shocks. The goal is that in seven years, by 2030, so again, this policy was made in 2018, um, and then we make an allowance for 20-year period to say, fine, if in 2018 we made a decision uh, saying, looking at our history, coal, coal consumption and renewables and all of our efforts so far, if at 2018, we'll make a decision to say uh, by 2030, we want to have reduced our emissions by 26%. At that level, we want to say, yes, we are achieving our target and that by 2050 again, we'll be there. But if in the short term, in seven years time or in 10 year period, we are able, or in 20 year period, we are able to reduce our emissions by 26%. How can we do that? How can we arrive at that destination? And that's what this machine learning model does. 
That's how it helps us. So what we do is to generate counterfactual shocks. Um, and counterfactual shocks tells you how um, the direction, what the direction should be. So counterfactual shocks, again, uh, you know, shocks the model, shocks the data, and, you know, gives you some experimentation, some results on what the goal will be. Now, on the left, on the screen here, you would see um, the 26% shock to core, which is a dirty energy here, non-renewable. Uh, and then on the right, you would see, again, a 26% shock to renewables. So again, the current historical data for both renewable and non-renewable being shocked by 26% to tell us if in 2038, Japan would have been able to achieve that goal of reducing emissions significantly. What we find is a bit surprising. So it means uh, from the data here in summary, the results are the same. They would both reduce emissions um, if you go both ways. One will reduce emission faster, but again, it tells you that quantitative analysis like this would need some qualitative um, evidences as well. So the government will still need to think, what exactly will be the cost um, if we attach a cost to this? Um, and it seems there are arguments instead to go for renewables. However, if renewables should be more expensive, what will be the best uh, direction? So it reveals that current increases emissions, uh, but then it begins to develop, it begins to decrease. Um, and then on the right hand side for renewables, we see that um, no, uh, renewable energies will again start to elevate emissions, but then it will continue to decrease significantly. Uh, the, the level of carbon emissions. And in terms of robustness checks, again, we always argue, um, is this reliable? Can we depend on these results? Are these just mere estimations? Or what? Do, how do we best understand uh, these marginal effects? And then we now go into the various marginal effects. So for current, uh, we see that lower levels of current uh, will definitely increase emission. But again, at a lower rate, it gets to a point where higher levels of coal will increase carbon emissions at a very high rate. So it's again important that there is a, uh, uh, an adverse impact of using coal on, on the environment. Again, so many countries are trying to, well, before the pandemic, were making efforts to reduce reliance on coal for several you know, industries. But again, um, since the pandemic, and we know when governments struggle, sometimes the the the, the, the um, Sort of you know go back on some of their promises or some of the plans again you want to survive as, as a country or as a business and as such there are challenges there but again these are pre-covid -pre data and these are pre-covid estimations which suggest that countries can continue um, at that level pre-covid and they would be able to arrive at uh, the goal especially using the case study of japan and we also see in terms of renewable energy consumption higher levels of renewables um, at the beginning, it may tend to increase um, carbon emissions again because of you know the uh, some argue that the creation of renewable energy products even contribute to emissions, uh, and so there are all kinds of arguments. However, renewable energy has the capacity to significantly reduce carbon emissions in the longer term. So it's a lot more uh, arguable. It's a lot more arguable to focus uh, on renewables um, for any country, particularly for a country like Japan with a complex economy. Again, complexity here is accounted for um, in, in, this, in this research. Um, in general, we argue that coal emits more CO2 uh, and renewable depletes CO2. So the algorithm tells us that if Japan um, would like to look into the future, um, especially in terms of the knowledge and, and the know-how that goes into production, then you really want to consider what is the best policy? What is the best option for us to get there? And uh, as I begin to round up my uh, talk, um, we know that there are you know, complexities in all of the processes that go into production. Um, and you know, there are energy and environmental ambitions for several countries, several countries have goals. Uh, but with a simulation using the canal-based you know, machine learning algorithm, it's driven by machine learning models. Um, and using that to simulate the policy, to try to understand what option is best, we find that they may have parallel outcomes, um, but there should be policies 
that will focus more on renewables. And that's the, that's the focus of, of, of this research. There are options uh, for choice of simulation shocks, um, which potentially maybe argue, argued as a drawback here, uh, because there is no standard to the shocks. It has to be driven by the policy. So if I select 26%, somebody else might select a different shock value. So what if I shock your variable and your model, your algorithm, what if I shock it by 30% or higher? What, how, would, how would the result behave? So there might be tendencies for exploiting these um, counterfactual shocks. Um, and so within the model, it's important to try to understand the need to um, you know, stay within a policy-driven model. And that is the focus of um, um, the presentation. And I look forward to more questions. Uh, please feel free to uh, send me questions, comments, contributions. There are some papers I have published in the literature that focus on, uh, on this area of research. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to receiving your emails, questions, comments, uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.